slide here. So as I mentioned, uh, John Brandt um, will be leading the discussion. John is the uh, CEO and founder of the uh, MPI group with more than two decades of studying leadership in effective um, personal driven uh, organizations. John will also be joined by uh, Gisela Albuquerque Weiss. Gisela is our um, education uh, industry marketing specialist here um, at Canon USA, um, having served roles as a higher education IT director and instructional uh, technologist and, uh, and as a, and a faculty member. I'm also going to introduce um, Thomas Baker. Thomas is our legal industry marketing specialist here at Canon USA, and he's a technology enthusiast, project manager, and con consummate champion of uh, problem solving. So um, we'll look forward to a uh, very engaging and, and thought-provoking uh, session here. If um, you'd like to uh, type in your, um, your, your questions, um, we'll be happy to uh, you know, try to answer as many as we could at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation will also be recorded, so you'll have a chance to um, go back and review the content, um, which we'll be, sh be sharing with everyone um, after the event. So uh, with that, I am going to turn the controls over to Mr. John Brandt. And uh, John? Terrific. Thank you. Oops. There we go. Hi, this is John Brandt. I'm CEO of the MPI Group. Paul, thank you very much. Happy to join you and Thomas and Gisela on this. This is a really, really important topic for businesses. And there, there's been a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of stress, a lot of concern. And we're seeing some interesting thing, ha things happen with this. And there is a still, I think, some confusion out there about who is actually subject to complying with these regulations. Um, so lots of risks, but still some opportunities. Um, the general data protection regulation in the European Union has really changed the way that organizations have to think about data security of personal information. Um, it was implemented over a, a little over a year ago, but we are seeing um, still people having trouble with this. But we're also seeing people doing some interesting things. They're taking this opportunity right now to look at their data security, but to use it in a way to, to sort of streamline their information flows by mapping them out. We're going to talk a little bit about how you might do that. They are taking an opportunity to implement, implement best practices and new technologies, not just for security reasons, but also to improve those flows, improve productivity, and the hope is obviously improve profitability and costs. And they're also trying to take this opportunity understanding that this is really just the tip of the spear right now. This is the first set of comprehensive uh, privacy regulations related to individuals. There are lots of other places around the world where similar regulations or maybe even stricter ones could be adopted in the future. We're going to talk about all that today. Again, as Paul mentioned, if you've got uh, questions, please feel free to type those in and we will get to them at the end as we can. So. We're going to talk about four different things today, just the basics. I want to you know, level set with where we're at with uh, GDPR, the types of risks that it poses for businesses, um, how to minimize those risks, and then what are those opportunities to really move forward. So as I mentioned before, GDPR is changing the way that organizations handle personal information. It replaced the uh, Data Pro Protection Directive 9546EC, basically trying to figure out a way to make sure that data privacy laws were harmonized across all EU member states. The important thing to remember about this is that GDPR doesn't just apply in the European Union. It applies to anybody, whether they're in the EU or else, who is processing the data of individuals who are in the EU. So it's not just EU organizations that are subject to this. It is U.S. organizations, you know, organizations from any other country. So what it did is it assigned control of personal data to specific individuals in the EU and incorporated new rights for data subjects within the European Union. And it has now significantly altered the ways that organizations are trying to manage that information, including some specific roles in, in organizations, or at least that's what it should have done. There are still some organizations who are a little bit behind. So what does that mean? What, what do we have to do to, to – what, what are we talking about here? Well. It granted new rights for, about information. For example, if you are an EU data subject, and really that's just you as an individual, if you're an EU individual, you have the right to obtain from what's called a data controller, and we'll talk about that in a minute, information as to whether or not they have personal information about you that's being processed, 
and if so, you have the right to access that information. You also have a right to ask, why are they processing that information? What categories are you using? Who have they given it to? And what are they doing with it? Subsequent to that, if you're an EU uh, data subject, you have the right to be forgotten. You have the right to request from anybody who is processing that data, the controllers, that your personal data be erased reasonably quickly, and, they are, and the data controllers are then obligated to do that for you. You also have a, a right to, to take a look at automated individual decision making. You have a right to not be, have a decision uh, made about you that is based solely on automated data processing, including data profiling of you. And the law has certain regulations about how a person can be profiled for purpose of analyzing or predicting your personal preferences, your behaviors, and attitudes. This is a very far-reaching law talking about not just that you have the right to to know if your data is being processed or to know or to be forgotten, you have a right to say you can't do this, you can't do certain things with this data. And it's really got some teeth in it because the consent is very is very strict. Unless expressly allowed by law, and there are some exceptions in that case, your data, if you're an EU subject, can't be processed without your consent. And that consent has to be something where you are actively giving it to them. It has to be unambiguous. Uh, you have to give a written statement. You have to tick a box. You know, we've all been to websites uh, over the years where there's a pre-tick box. Th those, those don't cut it in this situation. That is not actual consent. You have to actually make a proactive gesture indicating your consent. You have the right to data portability. An EU data subject has the right to get the data that is concerning to you, and you, you have the right to have it supplied to you in a commonly used machine-readable format, and you have the right to transmit that data to a different controller if you so choose, really giving you control of your data. Um, personal data um, also has a time limit on it. It can only be kept for the time that, for the, that is necessary. It can't be kept indefinitely. Um, it can be longer in certain exceptions if it's in, in the public interest, if it's for scientific or statistical or historical research purposes. It's really a, a quite a stringent amount of, of uh, rights and, and really restoring some privacy and some rights to people. The law also establishes then several specific roles. First is a data controller, and that is a, a person, a public authority agency that alone or with others determines the purposes and the means of the processing of the data about EU subjects. That person is responsible for uh, setting up appropriate technical and organizational measures to make sure that it's, uh, everything's done in accordance with GDPR, including uh, data protection policies. The, the regulation also sets up then a data processor, and a data processor basically reports or work, does work on behalf of the data controller. And that can be an individual, it can be an authority, an agency, um, it is somebody who is actually doing the processing. The controller might actually be doing the processing too, but the controller is the one making the decisions. Um, processors have to meet the standards that are set by the controllers, and when the processing is done, the controller is responsible for making sure that that processor is doing everything appropriately and in accordance with GDPR. So you've got a data controller making the decisions. You've got a data processor who's actually doing the processing. You also then have a role um, for a data protection officer. And this is designated by the controller and the processor Anytime the process is being carried out by some kind of a public authority or agency or body, um, except for courts, except for when there are operations that require regular monitoring of data, data, data subjects, and um, if it's relating to something uh, to Article 9 of the GDPR and criminal convictions or offenses related to Article 10. Quite extensive here. So, what does all this mean? Well, it means, as you can imagine, data privacy and managing that on the behalf of firms everywhere in the world just got a lot more complicated. It increased the data security responsibilities and the risks. And the thing that I want to stress is that we are already seeing that this is likely just the first of many laws like this. There are other regulatory bodies and authorities, whether national, uh, regional, et cetera, around the world, that are sort of following that lead. For example, in June of, uh, in June of last year, California passed a digital privacy law, which is going to go into effect this coming January on the 1st, that is going to give consumers more control over their personal information collected by businesses. This is likely just the start 
of, of a tidal wave of this kind because there is a lot of concern out there among individuals, among regulators, that data is, is not being managed properly about individuals. Now, I mentioned before that this law has some real teeth, and the real teeth are not just uh, regulatory, they are actually financial. Um, GDPR and some of these others are going to make things very, very costly if you are running a company and you make a mistake. For example, for GDPR, if you don't comply, fines for that can reach up to 20 million euros or 4% of an organization's annual worldwide revenue or turnover, as they would say in the EU, of the preceding financial year, whichever is greater. That's a really, really big and scary thing. That is the thing that most of the coverage of GDPR has focused on. What has been missed a little bit, I think, is the opportunity for process improvements and the opportunity to lean out information workflows uh, throughout the organization at, at a number of institutions. Because as you start analyzing, one of the things you have to do, and we're going to talk about this, is you have to start analyzing where does information go in your, information, in your organization? How is it flowing? What is happening? And typically when you start mapping that, you start finding all kinds of uh, bottlenecks, waste points, et cetera, where you can actually streamline the operation and make things more productive. And there's a real opportunity here as well, along with obviously the threat of a, of a large fine if you don't do it well. So we've talked about GDPR basics. Let's talk about the types of business risks. So when we see international information sharing, we see that for U.S. firms in particular, there is a large, large, large risk right now. Um, if you look at you know different different sectors here, educational institutions, you've got you know more than a million international students in U.S. higher ed in the uh, most recent year for which figures are available. In finance, the EU imported 21.5 billion euros of financial services from the United States. In healthcare, you've got well over 100,000 non-U.S. citizens coming from other countries uh, to, to, for medical care. In the legal sector, you've got companies conducting business in the EU. They are, and if they're conducting business in the EU, they're going to expect that their law firms, wherever they're based, U.S. or elsewhere, to offer them counsel on how to comply with GDPR. And in terms of uh, exports of goods and services to Europe, that was uh, $632 billion. Imports from Europe were $741 uh, billion. That's a lot of money and a lot of uh, opportunity for risk there. So let's talk about some of the specific areas of, of risk for folks. And I think I'm, I'm going to ask Gisela and, and Thomas to, to chime in here as appropriate because I know they do a lot of work in some of these sectors. For education institutions, you know, you've got student records, applications for admission, alumni records, research institutional data, communications. Gisela, there's probably lots more there too as well. Certainly, uh, I would add to that uh, the expansion of distance learning uh, as a global phenomena. You know, and there are more and more international students uh, within the territory of the United States, but also taking courses uh, from abroad, but enrolled in courses, uh, you know, through American organizations, and uh, some of them are, you know, are European um, uh, subjects. Uh, but uh, to your point of uh, uh, other laws that have been prompted by uh, GDPR or inspired by GDPR, such as the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, that certainly will uh, um, impact uh, uh, education organizations, not only higher ed, but K-12 as well, and also uh, the Children's uh, Online Privacy Protection Act, um, uh, the COPA law. Uh, it's also facing amendments proposed uh, by uh, the Senate and uh, uh, the authors uh, have been uh, looking into the DPR uh, as uh, an inspiration for those amendments. Um, there's much more that we can talk about here, but I want to uh, keep moving on with uh, your presentation, John. Thanks, Giselle. <clears throat> so that's an education. You can imagine all the uh, – look at health care. We all know how, how uh, HIPAA has uh, changed things in the United States over the last few years. Well, any EU patient, their care record, billing records, job applications, physician staff records, research and clinical trial data, any kind of communications or marketing to EU subjects, whether it's direct, whether it's Facebook, social media, et cetera, pharmaceutical records, incredible number of, of records that need to be managed and, and made, made sure that they are secure and in compliance with GDPR. 
for financial institutions. You know, you've got customer records, you've got uh, online banking investment access, job applications, employee records, account statements. You know, again, the whole marketing thing, any, any, of, any of that can be subject to GDPR. With law firms, and I know Thomas will want to uh, talk, uh, chime, chime in here a little bit too, but, you know, client records, billing records, uh, legal research, client correspondence and communications. Thomas, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, John, it is. Um, when you started thinking about the amount of import-export that's going in and out of uh, Europe and the amount of transactions that happen with the U.S., law firms are going to be interested in this kind of work, but also the corporate counsels that are involved with the, uh, the businesses, their attorneys are going to be very interested in understanding what that means to the kind of handling of data, because when you have a transaction, when you have a sale going across to Europe or back, you're going to be tracking some sort of some form of user data alongside that. So the volume of transactions means that these uh, business uh, corporate counsel uh, attorneys are going to be very interested in watching how are we going to mitigate some of this risk for handling all this personal information or sales record information that handles that is associated with the customers. So these are going to end up coming back to the U.S. law firms who are going to be, you know, assisting with some of this uh, remediation understanding uh, for the corporate counsels. This is a very important aspect of this uh, when we start thinking about it. Many uh, U.S. law firms don't really know where they're going to go with this yet, but the idea is they need to be prepared for it and understand that the personal information that's out there can be protected, but they are the first line of defense in understanding how to start remediating in terms of the legal responsibilities of the businesses that they actually support. Back to you, John. Thanks, Thomas. So lots of risk right now. Um, and we know there's lots of risk. We knew this going into this a year ago and in the, in the lead up to it. What we've seen over the last year has only sort of confirmed what we thought might happen. In the last year, there have been 95,180 complaints from citizens. Um, I'm sorry, that was just through January, not even in the last year. The most, type of com the most common types of complaints were for promotional emails, for telemarketing, for video, sale for vi I'm sorry, video surveillance or uh, closed camera television. You had 41,000, over 41,000 data breach notifications that were reported by companies themselves because there's a big requirement for that. And there were three fines issued, uh, and, and although there are lots of other cases that are continuing right now. There was a 50 million euro fine for a lack of consent on ads. There was a 20,000 euro fine for failing to secure user data, and an over 5,000 euro uh, fine for unlawful video surveillance. So this is serious stuff. This is not something you want to run afoul of. And I want to stress, you know, you'll note there that some of the, a lot of those breaches were reported by the companies. That's because GDPR requires that a security breach, if you know about it, must be reported to authorities within 72 hours of the time that you become aware of it. And the hard part about that is that these breaches can happen in any number of ways in any, any kind of industry, and it creates a lot of additional pressure. I mean, when you look at the number of breaches, and these are just U.S. breaches, so you can see, you know, there were uh, over 1,200 breaches by U.S. firms of GDPR related to EU data subjects, people in the EU. Um, there were over, uh, so over 1,200 breaches. It affected 446 million records. That's a lot. That's a lot of risk right there. And it's not only going to get stickier and stickier. Because what we're seeing right now, GDPR is applicable in all European Union countries, but they're, because of the nature of the EU, GDPR requires that an EU member state actually adapt their national laws to, to GDPR. There are 23 member states that have already adopted that, but there are five countries that are still in the process. And that's uh, Bulgaria, Greece, Slovenia, Portugal, and Czechia. So that's the basics. That's the risks. What do you have to do to minimize those? Um, what we find here is that a lot of organizations, when it comes to data security, especially at this level, are still fairly challenged and maybe overwhelmed in terms of figuring out their processes and their technology. Um, 
these companies should already, given the fact that it, it's been over a year that this legislation has been in place and given the fact that it was known for a year or two leading up to it, what you have to do is you need to know what data you're collecting, you need to know why you're collecting it, you need to know where it's held and processed, you need to know who has access. So that sounds fairly simple. The problem is, is that most companies have a lot of a ton of applications, they've got legacy systems, especially within an, an organization or an institution of size. Um, they may be connecting with other institutions, whether it's in a supply chain or in partnerships or joint ventures. And actually, if they haven't gone to the process of mapping where the information is flowing within their organizations, they may not actually know. And that is a huge problem because you are opening yourself up to risk if you don't know that. What this means is that one of the best practice that we're seeing now is that you have to start working on developing a fairly detailed strategy on how to stay in front of GDPR. And, and as I said before, not just GDPR, you have to expect that there are going to be other regulations. This is not something that you might be able to do one time and take care of for GDPR. This is going to be an ongoing uh, program and a strategy that needs to be updated probably on an annual basis. And so when we talk about a strategy, what do we mean? What we mean is an organization-wide data strategy and you have to have all your functions, all your units, all your technology problems in alignment contributing to the solution. One of the big issues that companies are facing right now is if they've got rogue applications. You might have done a merger or something and, and left things in place. You've got applications which aren't necessarily compliant with your strategies. That's going to be an even bigger issue in the GDPR age. So what does that strategy have to contain? Well, first of all, you have to have an overall enterprise or institution information strategy. And I'm probably going to ask Gisela and Thomas in a minute here to, for comments on a couple, uh, maybe the technologies and some of this. But you, this needs to be based on a review of types of information that are needed to fulfill your mission. Are you only collecting data that you actually need? Are you collecting data that you don't need somebody just put on a form at some point? You need to know where that information is being held, who, can, who has access to it, and are the ways that you're managing it in compliance with GDPR. Along with that, what we're seeing at successful uh, organizations uh, who are implementing this is they're also not just going through a strategic planning process, they're actually going through an education process with everybody and a training process with everybody who works at the firm to make them aware of GDPR and other data privacy regulations so that they are managing things in a way that's appropriate. Okay, once you've got that overall strategy, you then have to cascade that down to an information technology department technical uh, strategies or series of them. It has to be aligned with the first strategy, what is the overall goal. It also probably means taking a look at integrating some systems, maybe updating some legacy technologies. Um, you, you're really going to have to take a look at is there a way for us to, to deploy some kind of a technology that makes us aware when breaches happen since you have that 72-hour requirement. And it's also really, really important to remember that the strategy is going to be enterprise-wide, which means it needs to be cross-functional, and the IT group needs to play a key role in data governance and in the strategies to carry that out. One thing you may not, that I'm sorry, not you, but may, a number of people may not be aware of is the fact that once you do this, you then have to cascade this not just in your organization strategy or in how you're doing things with technology, you need to take a look at procurement guidelines and contracts because if you're going to try to minimize these risks, you're going to need to make sure that any vendors you use, whether it's for systems or devices, et cetera, or whether it's consulting, et cetera, you need to make sure that they are going to be compliant too because you don't want to be liable for a risk that they have inflicted upon you. A lot of times we see people now starting to use purchasing association contracts, sort of standardized contracts that allow that because they've got clauses built in that have been, that have been pre-vetted. And then Thomas and Gisela, I know you're seeing a lot of this with a number of the people you've, you uh, work with in the industry. Certainly, John. Um, what I would like to highlight is that uh, while GDPR has uh, brought to light, um, you know, uh, the need to uh, protect uh, personal data, um, it also, uh, to me, it basically enforces a need that already existed, not only within education organizations, a need for process improvement, for better information management, and for, uh, you know, a, a, a type of a, a layered security approach 
that uh, organizations uh, no longer can avoid in order to help mitigate risk. Um, you know, just a, quickly a few examples that come to mind in higher education, the recent uh, admissions, uh, um, you know, uh, process uh, issues that we have seen, um, you know, uh, bring to light the need to, to have a little more robust uh, information management with uh, more data integrity. Uh, and in K-12, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about personalized learning and how to leverage student information towards that, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the materialization of uh, personalized learning, which is something that teachers and administrators uh, struggle with. Uh, all that is true. I mean, the information is there. The information is needed. Education organizations in the U.S. deal with uh, uh, millions uh, of students and, uh, uh, and, involve, and all the information that goes with it, the information that comes with the student and the information that's generated uh, through the student life cycle within their organization. That information is relevant to the, uh, the, the education process, the teaching and learning process. But at the same time, it needs to be safeguarded and it needs to be shared only with the people who need to know uh, that information in order to benefit uh, the student, for instance. And I'd like to chime in with that when you're talking about the legal industry. Um, the law firms have been going through a fundamental change in, in recent years in the way that they are approaching their own market. Uh, it is no longer the old, old way of doing things. Uh, law firms have, uh, ha have faced an economic change that impacted their ability to hit their bottom line. The, um, the external entities are asking for more transparency in their activities. And the reality is for a firm that can't keep up with this, they're going to find themselves behind in terms of competitive ability. They're going to find that uh, their inability to manage information puts them at a competitive disadvantage. And what we want to do is really focus on the idea that this has long been thought inside of a law firm, any information management, governance, uh, records management, anything along those lines has always been kind of relegated to the, you know, well, that hits my bottom line, and that's kind of, you know, a, a poor way of looking at it, but it's been sufficient in the past, and it is no longer sufficient. Law firms really need to look at this as a competitive strategy by demonstrating to their own clients that they can be a better custodian of the protected information that they're entrusted with. Law firms have a better opportunity to make themselves competitive in their own market space, and that's where we want to really change this mindset away from this being a, a challenge or a cost center, but more of a building into a competitive future for law firms when they start getting their hands around the governance tactics that they have in play today and the strategies they have going forward in the future. And uh, back to you, John. Thanks, Thomas. So if, you then, if you've got this strategy then, then you need to take steps to help you improve compliance uh, of your information workflows. And so a number of things there. You, you need to start mapping your workflow there. You need to understand why the data is collected where it's kept. You need to make sure that you have got a document that is, uh, that is putting down why you're collecting this information uh, from an EU data subject, what's done with it, whom you're giving it to, even if you didn't collect the data in the first place. And that is really key. If you've got the data, you are at risk. The other thing is you need to think about this the same way you'd think about whether it's in a production operation, a claims processing, or any, any, any process that you might map. You need to think about your information as having the same sort of work stream where you're going to trace the collection and the processing and the information, gauge at every step, are you adhering to GDPR and other data privacy requirements? And the real key here, which we're going to get to in a couple minutes, is that as you're doing this, you're going to be able to document, wow, here's a place where we're really wasting a lot of time or we're doing, or we're doing work multiple times. Maybe that's an opportunity to improve productivity. Along with that, though, along with mapping that, you're going to need to make sure that you can accommodate customized data requests and requirements. Because remember, you've got EU data subjects who can contact you and ask, you know, what kind of data you're collecting about them, what you're doing with it. And you're going to have to make sure that you've got a data workflow that is flexible enough that you can respond to individual requests in a timely manner. 
and you need to figure out is there a way that you can automate that because literally what you don't you do not want to be taking your information and having somebody tied up doing this there so again as you're working on this along with doing all that you're then going to need on an, on a very regular basis make sure that you are reviewing the alignment of all across the organization of anything that you're doing with personal data collecting hosting managing sharing making sure that you've got a cross-functional group. Again, I want to stress this is a cross-functional because you've got lots of people accessing data in lots of different ways. If you only talk to IT or you only talk to one department that's collecting it, you're not going to know where all that data is going. You need to map them. You need to establish policies. You need to, if you're going to try something new, one of the things we've seen work very well is to make sure that you model it in one location, one area, one office, give it a try, find out what works and what doesn't, find out what exposures you've got, find out uh, how, it, how it affects compliance. You want to make sure that you then do that education effort that I talked about. You want to make sure that it's not just we're fixing this workflow, da, da, da. You want to make sure that everybody in the organization understands that data privacy is not just a nice to do thing, it is a must do thing at this point. And again, you've got to review this on a, on a very regular basis. I would say at least annually, if not more often. And there are lots of examples of companies who are taking this opportunity to, to do this and leverage this. For example, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, which is a division of Bank of America, established an organization-wide GDPR program to make sure that not just their employees, but their partners and their vendors were all processing data in compliance with GDPR. Um, one of the things that we see as a best practice in any initiative like this is to make sure that there is a key executive or group of executives sponsoring it so people know they need to pay attention. You need to make sure it's covering uh, any subsidiaries, affiliates. It needs to be a thorough review of all your data processing activities. And for a bank, for example, it could be applications, databases, processes, uh, accounts, etc. And they also then set up a network of country compliance officers and a global legal and compliance team to make sure that they've got somebody looking at this on an ongoing basis. It's really important and it's a big opportunity and, and it's working well. You've also got uh, other examples within other sectors. For example, Ohio State, the Ohio State University um, facing this decided to set up a working group, again, cross-functional. They included people from enterprise security, from the medical center, office of research, legal, compliance and integrity, academic affairs, to get together and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? They created a plan that would meet GDPR requirements, established a governance around that, began the implementation, and again, the education component. They set up an FAQ for the university's website to make sure that everybody understood the need for this and what the university was doing to ensure compliance. Then you've got an ERP company, a company called Unit 4, based in the Netherlands, wanted to increase uh, increase trust among its customers and, and client base, but also improve its reputation by demonstrating using GDPR actually to, to, to create a halo effect for themselves. What they did was they uh, worked internally to figure out what kind of customer and employee data it held, how it was processed, established again a, an, an enterprise-wide program, created a, an organization for data protection officer, and they really uh, completely redesigned their product development process and they turned compliance into a competitive strength by highlighting the fact that they were at the head of this. And there's an opportunity still, because there are lots of companies that are behind, there's an opportunity for companies that do this to demonstrate to their industry and to their customers that they are leaders in this. And they've been, you know, received, uh, gotten a lot of insight into what their customers are doing and into data privacy, and it has allowed them to work more effectively in creating new products and new services for their customers. So that's what we've got in terms of the update, the risks, how to minimize the risks. Now here's the really exciting part. This is the part where the, the money that you're spending on this, the effort that you're going to invest in this, doesn't necessarily have to just be all about minimizing risk or controlling risk. It can actually be about improving your business. So what do we mean by that? We've got a lot of organizations over the years have tried different improvement methodologies, whether it's Lean, Six Sigma, theory of constraints, et cetera. We've got some of those organizations that are improvement-minded are looking at data privacy as an opportunity, again, not just to spend money to secure things, but also to say, look, if we're analyzing our processes here, if we're analyzing our information flows, what can we do that might actually make our business better as well? So what they're able to, what they're trying to do is in tandem, 
ensure that they're GDR compliant, improve data privacy and, and data flow, but also then make sure that they are being as efficient and pos as possible in how they process and use data. They're implementing new models, they're using new best practices, they're using new technologies. This goes hand in hand. I know there'll be a, a number of people on this call who've, who've used an improvement methodology or have used lean. Lean organizations have used process mapping, literally just saying so if we're making something, if we're processing something, if we're processing a claim, if it's, if it's an accounts, accounts receivable, accounts payable, you know, document, just mapping it out, how do we do this, and finding out where it waits, how long it waits, why are we doing things twice, doing that because this is the way that you get rid of waste that drains profits and makes customers crazy, and frankly makes your staff crazy too when they're doing work m multiple times. This same sort of value stream mapping or value mapping or process mapping, whatever you want to call it, and there's lots of ways to do it. I've seen process maps that were as long as a hallway. I've seen process maps that had three steps in them. It's really important to do this in this situation because it is going to analyze where your security problems might be with GDPR, but it's also going to tell you where your opportunities to improve your information flow are. The mapping will identify those gaps in security. It will identify waste at the same time and allow you to, uh, to, to log those and attack those as problems to fix. There are a lot of opportunities as you do this to improve the security. You know, if you've got new security controls and automated tracking mechanisms, those will help you to automatically document that you're being compliant. And there are also a number of technologies that have come along that can be integrated in the processes to help minimize the risk of a breach. You know, things like incorporating protected or, or uh, sensitive content into a workflow as soon as data is received, making sure that you're limited, limiting, off, uh, limiting access to office devices or storage devices of any kind, and making sure that your systems have got any digital communications, have classification tools to make sure that they are cataloging, storing them, and protecting them appropriately. And there's a lot of opportunities as well to improve overall personal information management. Um, you can protect this by setting up a new infrastructure and policies. A lot of best practices internally um, can then serve as a template that you might be able to share with others, vendors, et cetera, people you're working with in the industry. And can also, if you do a merger, you're going to be able to, to take those to, to new partners, new joint ventures, et cetera. Gisela, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about what you're seeing with, some, with what you're doing in higher ed. Uh, hi, John. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, what's, uh, in high ed, uh, we, what we are seeing primarily is that, uh, that the organizations are setting uh, information security policy uh, and, you know, training uh, uh, the constituencies, the student, faculty, and staff. Uh, but this is uh, not an easy task. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, observations, you know, where the challenges amount to uh, it's the, the, the practical side of uh, um, making the, the, the policy stick to those constituencies. Even though some, uh, you know, people are embrace the policy and there is uh, um, a lot of, um, uh, like you see a lot of campaigns within uh, universities, large universities in particular, but you know, all kinds of organizations uh, around information security. Uh, as we know, um, we as humans are the weakest links. So uh, unless the technology comes to the aid of uh, this uh, uh, implementation of an information security policy, uh, it's not likely to be uh, successful, at least not in the short term. And uh, as we know, uh, you know, time is of essence here with uh, uh, the steep fines of these regulations. Even though education organizations may not be primary target of GDPR um, and other uh, uh, U.S.-based legislation that may model on GDPR, uh, certainly uh, they will become uh, eventually a target. But first and foremost, it's also important to um, think about education organizations as providing a service to students. And um, as Thomas mentioned, you know, uh, 
you know, the, the, the competitive edge here element is important. Even, uh, although education institutions are typically not for profit, uh, if, um, if students uh, are not able to trust the, the capacity of the organization in keeping their information safe, uh, then they may have other options to go to. So what I see happening not only in higher ed but also in K-12 here in the United States is that a lot of the organizations, the nonprofit organizations that, uh, uh, you know, support the uh, technology development uh, and lay out blueprints or best practices um, uh, through certifications uh, and whatnot, uh, such as EDUCAUSE in higher ed and the COSEN, the Consortium for School Networking in uh, the U.S., they are uh, deeply involved in conversations around the DPR regulation, uh, around ap applicability of the regulation to uh, U.S.-based education organizations. So I would uh, uh, suggest that uh, um, our audience that, you know, if they want to know more about how the DPR applies to education organizations, look into those uh, um, organizations such as COSEN and EDUCAUSE, in addition to uh, the information we are providing here now. Uh, also, uh, Canon has a lot of uh, information uh, on its website. Uh, on the industries and education, we have white papers, infographics that talk about information security and securing information uh, starting with the printer, for instance, and we have uh, data privacy pieces. Uh, we can also make this available to uh, the public in general if you want to know more about securing information within the education spaces. Back to you, John. Thank you. I think Thomas has a few things to talk about what's going on with uh, with law firms as well. Yeah, thank you, John. The uh, reality is that this is something that uh, all businesses need to uh, start thinking about, including law firms who may have felt that they were semi-exempt in the past. This is no longer the case, and they are realizing it. And what we want to do is really help them understand that there are um, there are tools out there. There are um, you know, materials and resources and individuals and companies like Canon that are invested in helping them understand how to better remediate some of these challenges and turning these challenges into opportunities. Uh, we have, for example, across our website, we've got articles um, relating to uh, GDPR, we've got articles relating to compliance, we have articles relating to security because you can't have one without the other. Um, there are white papers, there are other resources like uh, guides about hardening the equipment to make sure that we are compliant and, and how those can really benefit the, the law firm's business overall. What we really want to do is just help them understand that this is no longer just something they can just relegate to, maybe I'll get to it next year. It's something that they need to take seriously this year and it is no longer just something that is a, a painful cost center. It is an opportunity for their firm to become more efficient, productive, and overall competitive and profitable in their own market space. And these, these uh, materials and resources that we've been putting together are really trying to help be the thought leaders in, in driving that conversation inside the firm so that they have a means to have the, the conversations to help build business cases around moving this conversation forward. The ideas that are out there are really substantial and uh, thought-provoking and helpful for uh, law firm administrators who may sometimes find it hard to convince powers that be to make these changes, but the reality is when we start looking at them as competitive advantages, people start perking their ears up, and I think that's an opportunity for everyone to uh, grow and uh, change. So back to you, John. Terrific. Well, thanks. That is uh, what we have today. We've got time for questions here. I know we've got a, a few that have already come in. A couple have already come in here. So um, I think we should just start with uh, with the ones that we've got here. Let me take a look and take a look at the questions that came in. All right, we've got. All right, first question is: Person wants to know: Is there a single approach to GDPR compliance that, if properly implemented, is likely to address other future regulatory changes, such as the one you mentioned in California? Well, Giselle and Thomas, I'm going to ask you to comment on that in a minute, but I, I would just say in general, no. Um, you know, GDPR 
is, is as, as I mentioned before, the tip of the spear. It's the start of this. It's not necessarily, though, the end game. And then different, re, different regulatory authorities, different jurisdictions are going to have different things. I think it's more important for organizations who are already taking steps or are about to take steps uh, for GDPR compliance to, to do this idea of, of mapping out their information workflows and to be reassessing them on at least an annual basis. Um, there's no way to predict what, what, will, what will be the next sort of uh, regulation that, coming out, that comes along. What that means is that organizations have got to have a process that allows them to be flexible and adaptable so that if a new regulation comes out, they can figure out a way to map to it. Thomas, did you want to add anything? If there's a, a initiative to have a comprehensive um, deep dive look into their own organization's data flows, that's the best start. That's, that may be that singular bullet that somebody's looking for, but it's not going to be the only answer to this question. The idea of just simply starting to map and, and know where their data is, where it's coming from, and begin the regulatory process of of limiting where that data can be sent and who can access it is a great first step. It's not going to be a single magic bullet, though. I agree. I say due to that, and uh, taking control of the information work streams, uh, to me, is, uh, is what uh, any organization uh, must do, um, but certainly education organizations, not only to be, uh, to, to be in a position to mitigate risk. Uh, I would never use the word, you know, be compliant with any regulation. It's, uh, there's something that's uh, unachievable. Um, but uh, you can mitigate the risk. You can have, uh, as I mentioned before, a layered security approach throughout your um, information work streams. But the step the first step is to map those uh, workflows and the types of data, the workflows, and uh, you know the, the points of contact, uh, physical or otherwise, uh, where how the information gets into, uh, gets collected, uh, how is it tagged, where does it go, how is output it, and so forth and so on. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've got, we got, we got another question here. We says, okay, we are a small company, and we haven't yet done anything for GDPR. Should we? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, I think you guys will have an opinion on that. Uh, or you may not. I, I'm going to say that I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to advise somebody to do something or not to do something, but I would say that if you have any familiarity with GDPR regulations, you'll see that it, that although the, the, it is said to take into account, I think, I think it's a, the term is uh, the situation of micro, small, and medium-sized medium enterprises take into account, it doesn't exempt them. And what I that agree. means is that you can be at risk even if you're a small firm. Do you, do you guys agree? I agree, John, yeah. Uh, um, I totally agree. If I, if I uh, owned a small business, I would take steps to, to that. It would only... Um, open up uh, possibilities uh, for me uh, as a business owner, uh, so I wouldn't have to worry about uh, dealing with the information from um, um, a EU uh, subject. But uh, as we mentioned, there are other laws uh, and regulations that are coming up here, so it's certainly uh, some, something we are going to see more and more. But uh, more importantly, I think as I mentioned, for education organizations, mapping workflows, taking control of the information or work streams, it's not only about uh, compliance, it's about efficiency. You know, you build efficiencies if you are able to control, uh, you know, the information of your customers, the information of your organization, um, and uh, knowing where things start, where they end, and uh, all uh, the, you know, puzzle in between, you know, nowadays with uh, multiple systems, uh, that's uh, the reality for any industry. I would, uh, I would throw in an analogy for this, to be honest. Um, it, I, I look at uh, programs like GDPR and the California uh, regulations that are coming up, CCPA, uh, that are, you know, asking organizations to be, you know, better custodians of the information that they're holding, to have better data hygiene. I think the analogy is sim similar to, uh, you know, exercise and, and good, good health and eating <laughs> healthy. Um, the reality is it, it doesn't happen overnight. 
but it happens in small steps, whether you're a large company or a small company, and you've got to start someplace and start that process happening. And you will, you know, the results will show for themselves. Just because you may be not a target for GDPR because you're small enough and you're not going to be on, on their radar necessarily, I'm not saying one way or the other, but, you know, that may be the case, it doesn't mean that the good data hygiene isn't healthy for your organization's um, productivity and efficiency, to Giselle's point a minute ago. The, this is, this is good good behavior, it's good opportunity for a business to make themselves more efficient, more productive, and better uh, market uh, positioning in terms of competitive mm -hmm. stance. So uh, it's just a good strategy overall. It's not, not simply, you know, an exercise in futility. It's, it's really good for the organization. So it's, it's large or small, it's a good idea. Great. Well, terrific. Well, Gisela, Thomas, Paul, thank you very much for joining, and, and everybody who joined us today, thank you very much for joining us. It has been terrific. As Paul mentioned before, Paul may want to close us out here, but as Paul mentioned, the presentation is going to be available, uh, made available to those afterward, and if you, or if you need to come back and take a look at this presentation again, that will be made available as well. Paul, back to you. Yes, thank you, John, and I want to thank all of the uh, attendees for joining us. We had a very good turnout, and uh, most of you stayed through uh, the duration of the event, so I want to thank you all for your attention, and I want to also thank John, Gisela, and Thomas for uh, a great job, for a very informative presentation. We will provide a link to, the, uh, to a recorded version of the presentation, as well as links to some of the um, resources that Thomas and Gisela showed you where you can get more information from, uh, from Canon. So, uh, with, with that, we'll wrap it up, and again, I want to say thank you to all, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, John, Giselle, or Thomas using the contact information below. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.